I, I just happened while I'm reading Abrams and while I'm reading Young, I'm reading the Chronicles of Narnia to my children. Wow. Right? And Chronicles of Narnia is about these traumatized kids in London from around the period of World War II who go out into the country and they escape into this magical world where Jesus is right there, yeah. right? This is the world where Jesus is present for you and is gonna save your butt, right? Right, right, right. But that world is filled with satyrs and fawns and talking yeah. animals and naiads and dryads. The spirit of the forest, the spirit of the animals, the spirit of the trees is all present. And not only that, the capacity of mankind to become blind to those spirits is a central point in the story. And the magician's yeah. nephew, right? Uncle Andrew, right? Yeah. Cannot hear Aslan speak because he treats him as a dumb beast. And as we're going into Prince Caspian, the, the Telmarines have taken over the land and they've turned most of the animals into dumb beasts because they no longer listen to them. So, so there's, this, there's something in Lewis where he's saying he's this great apologist for Christianity. Right? And he wants to bring us back to Christianity. But in this children's story that he tells, he unites his Christianity with a return to animism. Yes, very much. Very and much. that's very outside of the main line of Christianity. I mean, this was part of the Nietzschean critique. When you split things like that, right, and then you say, and then what happens is this world is now, the natural world becomes completely equated with the fallen world, and it, it, it has no value in and of itself. It only has a value as a way of getting you to this world. And then what the problem that you then face is if you start to really realize that this world is inaccessible to you and maybe it doesn't even exist, then you're left with this. But this is the world that you've thrown, that has been, this is the, the world that you've thrown away, right? Um, and, uh, and so that's, I mean, I think there's deep connection, uh, as Nietzsche articulates, between that separation and the rise of nihilism. Um, Lewis is pointing, he's trying to do a couple things. He's trying to revivify the Neoplatonism within Christianity uh, to give us basically a scaffolding for the cultivation of wisdom because the scientific worldview isn't doing that for you. So you need, he wants to revive because what the professor's talking about at the end there, now that I remember, he's not talking about knowledge, he's talking about a lack of wisdom. He's talking about foolishness, right? Yeah. So he's trying to revivify the Neoplatonism to say, no, no, we need to get, we need a, we need, we need a scaffolding for wisdom. And then like you said, I, I think he is trying uh, in connection with that to, you know, bring back the, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, the spirit of nature, the way you're talking about it here. Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys. Welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. So this week, our guest once again is John Verbeke. John is one of my great friends and mentors in many of the things that I'm thinking about these days. And we have a conversation about once a month where we kind of dig deep into this stuff. Sometimes that just happens between us. Sometimes I record it because I feel like it's going to be worth sharing with you guys. And this is one of those cases. So I had a series of insights while meditating about the connection between some of the ideas that I was reading in David Abrams' book, The Spell of the Sensuous, with ideas from John Young's book, What the Robin Knows, and uh, The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, and how all this connected to some of the ideas that I learned from Jordan Peterson. And all of that, of course, is very, very tightly interwoven with John's work. Uh, so this is a very interesting conversation where we go deep into those insights, and then we get into some of John's critiques of Jordan Peterson's work and postmodernism and my own take on those things and, and how we see those things. So it's, it's quite a wide ranging conversation. And I think it's a very insightful conversation. Um, I got a ton out of it. It's part of this kind of ongoing dialogue that I'm having with John and John's having with other people. So I think you guys will get a lot out of it. 
Now, you may have noticed that we haven't had a lot of podcast episodes in the last couple of weeks. Um, and the reason for that is that essentially we are putting the podcast on hiatus for a little bit. And by hiatus, I mean we're just not going to prioritize it because what we're doing is we are going to be creating an embodied movement online summit. So we're going to have approximately 25 teachers getting together July 16th through the 20th for a free online um, summit to present a kind of coherent view of how we can build a practice that's optimally meaningful so we can sustain physical practice throughout our lives and cultivate ourselves through those physical practices. So we're gonna be looking at how movement connects to mindfulness, to nature connection, and to um, community, as well as how we can just address movement itself. So we've got some amazing speakers. We have Nick Winkleman, who's gonna be on the podcast next week. We have Perry Nicholson, who's been on the podcast recently. We've got um, Frank Forensic, who's an amazing guest we've had on here before. Um, we have a lot more coming. We've got uh, just an amazing group coming together, and we're really excited to share that with you. So, you know, lock that in on your calendars. Get ready. It's going to be uh, free uh, for you to come in and check it out. Get yourself registered. We'll have that up very soon on our website, if not already, when this is live. And that'll be linked in the show notes if it is live. Um, so yeah, very excited about that. While that's going on, we're going to have to deprioritize the podcast. So we've got this one. We've got uh, Winkleman coming out. We may have a few more coming out in between now and that time period, but we'll see what happens. We're not going to be recording those for a little bit while we focus on this. Now, this podcast is something that I'm getting so much out of. I'm getting to have conversations with people who are just incredible, and I'm really excited about it. And we're feeling uh, such, we're getting so much amazing feedback from the people who listen to the podcast about what they're getting out of it. But what we're not getting yet is a ton of support. And since this is a listener supported podcast, we could really use that. Um, it, is, it does take a lot of our time uh, to get it edited, it takes a lot of our time to. To, for me to do research and make sure that I'm prepared to talk to all these speakers and be in a, the right place to get you guys the best experience while listening to the podcast. So if you consider supporting us on Patreon, that'd be a big help right now as we prep for this summit and as we prepare for the next full season of the podcast, we're going to go deeper in getting a more professional setup and booking out guests further in advance in bulking our podcast so we really have a lot for you. So we're really excited about where this podcast is going, how we can foster further communications, our further um, uh, community around it. So if you're really into the podcast, you know, drop us a comment, let us know what you're doing, and certainly think about supporting us. Without further ado, though, John Verveke. Sharing some of these ideas with, uh, with one of my students, I realized it's kind of a, might be worth sharing as a podcast, just an interesting set of ideas. Okay, that's great. Let's, let's, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, what was okay. Well, I'll just get right into it. Um, so I was I was doing my sit spotting right, and I was reading David Abrams' book right. So I'll, I'll in the morning in my in my yard, I'll sit and I'll and I'll read. Um, have you read David Abrams' book, The Spell of the Sensuous? No, no. So it's an interesting book. He's like an ecological philosopher, and yeah. he um, uh, he's talking about phenomenology and. Uh, Husserl's work and then how Husserl turns uh, is picked up by Merleau-Ponty. Do you, are you familiar with Merleau-Ponty? Oh, very, very familiar with Merleau-Ponty. Very familiar with Merleau-Ponty. And all of the people that come out of Merleau-Ponty, like Dreyfus and Gallagher, that's okay. a big part of 4E cognitive science. Okay, beautiful. So I, I was not aware of that. So so he, he had this, this line about how um, at the level of our sensorial experience, we are all animists. Mm, mm. And he's talking about participation, right? That uh, yep. Levi Bruhl, the, Levi Bruhl, yep, yep, yep. Levi Bruhl, uh, had this idea that the indigenous experience of life was was one of participation with. Yep, yep. And the way I've been thinking about this is essentially that that what we describe as the objective world, it, where objects are inanimate, right? Um, all of those things are animate. They're agentic right so you all you think of them as being agents in the same way that you think of other people as being agents that's right that's right so you also think of them having an um an inner life yeah uh, not in a cartesian sense of subjectivity but you think of them 
um, having sort of an internal dynamic, um, mm -hmm. something about them that's analogous to the way you're a living thing. Yes. So, I was, so right before I read that book, I read a book called What the Robin Knows by John Young. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that? No, 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 no. Okay. So Tom Brown is one of the most famous kind of uh, sort of bushcraft specialists, nature connection specialists who really started all that work. And John Young is one of his students. And he founded the Wilderness Awareness School, which is here um, in Duval, just outside Seattle. And then many of his students have become students of mine. Right, right. School, right? right. Um, so he has this book called What the Robin Knows, and it describes basically his um, practice of bird language, right? So you, um, you go to a, I mean, the central practice we've talked about before, you sit and you listen to the birds, right? And then the birds have, uh, the birds have a specific set of calls, right? They, 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 yep. tend to, they tend to give you specific types of information. So there, there's the song, right? Which is like territory and, and sexuality. And then there's the, the companion call, which is sort of like checking in on each other. And then there's alarm calls and then there's aggression, right? right, right. And so if you're aware of, the, of whether song is happening or not, or what the baseline of all of the birds in the forest is, then you can pick up when they're quiet or when they're alarmed and that tells you about things that are happening in the environment. Right. Yeah. That makes good sense. Right? So, so the birds are in particular, they're basically like, they're kind of like the voice of the forest. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's always bird calls happening. And so it's this thing that you can tune into that gives you this window to what's happening in the world around you. Right. Right. Yeah. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking about how uh, one way that you could think about this is that when you're listening to the birds' voices, you're listening to the spirit of the birds. Mm, yeah. yeah. Or in some sense, the spirit of the forest itself. Sure. Yeah. And this could be thought of as you, you can make a non metaphysical or non supernatural description of this, where you could say that, you know, the birds are essentially like a neural network yeah, yeah, yeah. whose aggregate behavior you can tune into and basically talk to. Yeah. And when you're attuned to that, you're getting information that, that is actually potentially really profound. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think there's definitely, uh, uh, you know, you could say that there's a kind of, well, there's definitely a communication system and it's doing, uh, you know, a kind of collective distributed cognition problem solving, uh, you know, parceling out the forest into, uh, you know, so sort of optimal territories for mutual survivability, uh, mate finding, alarm calling, uh, noting, noting about predators. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, there's a there's a set, there's a way in which it's very much um, uh, it dis a distributed cognition, something like a neural net running off. And then, I mean, you can broaden it, you know, the way the trees are biochemically communicating with each other through the soil, um, and um, you know, there are lots of patterns of distributed communication and problem solving happening in uh, the ecology of a forest or the ecology of, a, of, of an ocean, things like that. Yes, I, I, yeah, I'm fine with that. So, so what I was thinking about was this idea that, like, if you're, if you're imagine you're a hunter-forager, you know, in an in a indigenous context, and you're walking through the woods, and something alerts you that there's a predator nearby, um, that might be an explicit awareness, right? Or it might be an implicit awareness. Yeah, a lot of implicit awareness is going on. Yeah, very much. Yeah. And that, 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 you know, that kind of the easiest way that you can pragmatically, it's actually pragmatic in this sense, maybe to conceptualize the thing that is alerting you as a spirit, as an animated force within the world that's external to human beings. Mm -hmm. So in some way, it, it almost recapitulates the spiritual. And yeah, I mean, 
uh, I mean, and you have something analogous that, that, I, that I talked about when you're in circling practices and people talk about the, uh, you know, the emerging spirit, the, the sort of collective intelligence, the we space that seems to be, uh, you know, uh, leading and directing things um, in powerful ways. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, that, that, that strikes me, uh, I, I mean, that strikes me as plausible and I think it goes towards what I was saying about, you know, how if you put narrative, in fact, puts you into a dynamical state of mind, it's very good for picking up on dynamical systems like the complex ecology before us. And what I said about shamans, you know, having improved insight and implicit learning, yeah. machinery. Yep, yeah, very much, of course. Yeah. And, and also having, and also really honing through um, imaginal, imaginal practices, not imaginary, imaginal practices, their participatory knowing, spending a lot of time, you know, in a serious play of being a deer gets you really good actually at tracking deer down and also listening to the deer and taking information from the deer. Yeah, th th this is all very, very powerful stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I would, um, I would argue that many of the arguments that I made already are, are, are deeply convergent with what you're proposing. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's interesting for me because it, it's the first time, like you and I have had this conversation where we've talked about the word spiritual and whether, yeah. whether that's a word that is useful, right? Yep. Yep. A word that, that carries so much baggage and is so fudgy that we should just stop and find yeah. out how to describe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but in some sense, this, this, this interaction between, you know, David Abrams and his description of, of Merleau-Ponty and John Young, yeah. it, 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 clicked in a way of looking at the spiritual for me, which suddenly yeah. gave it a, a kind of thing that feels like it would be hard to describe actually any other way. Well, that's what I mean when I'm trying to get about how what en enacted symbolism isn't just cognitive ornamentation and the imaginal isn't the same thing as the merely ima imaginary. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's what I've been trying to get at. Um, you should, you should know that the, the chapter that Chris and I wrote on dialectic and dialogos, mm -hmm. um, it's called Gnosis in the Second Person. We talk about, we call it, you know, the third factor that emerges when people are doing circling and things like that. But we also said, we also said the good word for it is the German word Geist, because mm -hmm. it hangs between sort of mind and spirit and, you know, um, you know, spirit of the times, you know, uh, so it, 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 it so, um, and that, that's the kind of language that we need to, in order for talk, talking about this. And you should know that very serious um, uh, cognitive psychologists, cognitive scientists, philosophers are talking about this. There's a lot of work on what's called we agency. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea that, uh, and there's some ghastly hard science about how uh, uh, distributed cognition can do things that individual cognition can't do. I don't know, they told, told you that experiment where the guy literally wired up a bunch of rat brains yeah. and the collective uh, can solve problems that the individual rats can't solve, just things like that. Um, but there's work being done on what's called we agency, um, the, the way, and what some people are coming towards, um, are you familiar with, there's a concept of what's called a philosophical zombie. A philosophical zombie is you know, a creature that has all of our intelligence but no consciousness. Yeah, and they're basically now used. There, I believe at least one or two articles where they're now saying, when you have like distributed cognition and it generates this kind of flowing collective intelligence, um, you have basically like a philosophical zombie. You've got something that's got uh, a, a sort of an intelligence of its own. It doesn't have consciousness, um, but it has intelligence, and it's interesting because. Um, Spirits are, I mean, even mythologically, spirits are weird. They sort of hang between being intelligences, like, like principalities, it's powers like, and principalities, powers. Yeah, yeah. right? And, and, and being full-blown conscious agents. And so that's why the term is also sort of good. It's right on that, like Geist is like that too. It's like yeah. ghost, right? It's mm -hmm. right on the edge of that there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to, one, one of the frames I'm looking at is like, if you're trying to, to root yourself in scientific epistemology, then, then 
accepting that there's a subjective conscious experience of the, the spirit of the forest uh, kind of takes you outside of that. Yeah, I, I, would push, I would push on that, right? I would say that it's not even a subjective. I would say, following Marleau-Ponty, it's, it's transjective. There's a kind of real affordance, not yeah. just imaginary. There's a kind of real affordance being opened up between you and the real distributed communication and cognition of the birds mm -hmm. and the trees, et cetera. Yeah. So w what I'm getting at is that, that I think that, you know, we all, like, I think that one of the fundamental problems we have is that we have to use our own minds as models, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When we're like, I think that the, like, I always think it's funny, you know, the, the golden rule is treat others as you would have, have them treat you, right? Yeah. Like the, the initiation of empathy is the realization that other people experience the same things that you do. Yes, yes. Right. That's, that's, the, that's the initiation of, of empathy. However, um, to effectively employ empathy over time, it's all about becoming sophisticated, about recognizing all the ways in which other people aren't actually like you. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. It's a funny thing. And in, in the same sense, it's like, if you're dealing with the distributed intelligence of the birds, the fastest model that you have to grab for how that operates is that it's fundamentally like your personality and experience, right? Right, right, right. right. Spirit of the forest. And from the perspective of someone who, who who's in an indigenous culture, that that may be the most pragmatic way to imagine the world or to oh, I, uh, I imagine the world almost makes it sound like you're accusing them of fantasy, but, but to, to image the world, yeah, right? Yeah. Better to interact with the world. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a, there's a conflict there with, with at least some elements of, of the historical scientific of epistemology. Right. And, and it gets at what I think is, you know, there's a, an interesting tension that I found in, in my work and people who are similar and attracted to that work between a kind of what I would describe as a naive desire to, to, um, to kind of to reject the West completely and embrace, okay. embrace this, that it's like, I want to go back, right? It's the Ishmael sort of perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. I was thinking about this specifically in reference to a couple of students who I had who um, who really wonderful, beautiful movers in nature. And, you know, they they were really inspired by that and they've continued to work. But essentially, there was a break point between myself and them over, you know, like, is the West basically just a perversion and, you know, of an of a Eden like, you know, previous existence? Yeah, the Rousseauian kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but I would say that. You know, I was trying to articulate to them the fact that, like, yes, there's wonderful things that we can learn from from hunter foragers, but there's also the reality that, like, violence is is far higher in those cultures. At least that's that's what it looks like from the archaeological record, from the ethnographic yeah. record. You know, yeah. they don't they don't have like a a wide circle of agapic empathy for for people yeah. outside of their tribe. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that there's something to be learned from from. Uh, from Christianity. And, and so as I was, was processing all these thoughts, I was thinking about, okay, the, the, you can think of like when, when, when they're calling towards spirituality or all these people who I'm running into through the circles around movement and yoga and all these things, and they're talking about spirituality, there's part of it that feels like it's this very fudgy thing that gets you to, to, to make claims that, that you can't back up and that are just fun, right? They're just, they're just like nice fantasies. I can push people over with cheat, right? Um, you know, if I, if I become a breatharian, I'll live forever because of energy. Um, and that, that stuff really bothers me, but then there's like, maybe there's something here that, that, uh, that can be articulated in a better way that, that, that still needs to be captured. Right. All right. Rafe, I mean, a, a lot of my project has been trying to come up with the language for articulating that place and that space. I yeah. mean, uh, I mean, that's what I've been trying to do. And, and, you know, and, and trying to keep that space from being absorbed or reduced to back to, you know, the traditional religious formulation or, or into some new age goopiness or just dismissed uh, by kind of, a, a, of an enlightenment view of science and, and reality. 
but yeah, you know, trying to keep that space stably in relation to those, but also not absorbed or reduced it. That's that's been that's 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 um, well, welcome to the space because it's a it's a <laughs> tricky space to be in. Um, I think it's the right place to be, but it's a tricky space to move around in. So there's two other things that struck me as I was going through these these thoughts that I wanted to share with you. One is um, this idea of the spirit of spirit as this kind of aggregate personality, this we we consciousness or we agency, as you were saying. That's yeah. that's pretty much what Jordan Peterson was trying to describe as God in his debate with Sam Harris, right? I, I think so. Uh, it, it's hard. Uh, because he also, I mean, there's a Jungian, there's a Jungian thing on it that's going there. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's very much, you see, so there's, I mean, there's Jung's God and there's Durkheim's God, right? And those are very different gods, right? And Durkheim is, God is basically the, uh, the enacted symbol, the imaginal symbol for these, the, what you're calling the spirit of distributed cognition. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, and, and then Jung has the idea um, that, uh, the collective unconscious uh, represents more the distillation of generations of people um, into our biology. Um, and at, 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 you know, I think Jordan at times was moving between them. Um, but, and that's fine because Jordan does what he does, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is I would want a more explicit and clean attempt to try and theoretically integrate those. And that's what I've been trying to do, right? To get them more explicitly laid out, find the problems about just, uh, about trying to put them together, integrate them together. Um, that, you know, that's a pro what I'm saying is I see that as a problem to be solved. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the way that I read that was like, if you think of Durkheim's God and, and Jung's God, um, it, it was almost as if Peterson was arguing that, that that the Jungian God is the reflection, is the inborn reflection of the aggregate of the Durkheimian God over time. Yeah, in a sense, in a sense. I'm going to uh, unpack that because I'm not sure that anybody else will understand that. So I want to just <laughs> make sure because we are, we are recording this. It's like it, Durkheim basically says that God is the representation, you know, I was just, the last time I read this was Durkheim was saying God is a representation of culture, essentially. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's that aggregate of of all the other people, right? And and what they represent that's held that that's held by you. And then, um, I think the 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 Jungian addition to that is that that thing sort of lives inside of you, even without exposure to the culture, because you've been selected by it over time. Yeah. There, so you're invoking like the Baldwin effect, and that would be, for example, uh, one of the theoretical machines I would bring out to try and integrate the two together. So, well, you know, the, the, in a similar way in which probably language was initially something that was mostly learned and was passed on culturally, but, you know, there's language creates an environment that has new selective pressure. The yeah. faster you learn language, the more successful you're going to be. And so biology is going to do everything it can uh, to make as much of the machinery for learning language as biologically innate as possible. And so it starts to get internalized. But you st that's, that still doesn't mean that you come with a particular language, right? Mm -hmm. You still, so, like, so uh, you know, you, you have to work out the, the, how all of this machinery is working and what you can claim it might plausibly uh, be inherited biologically, what still has to be learned from the environment. Because one of the things of culture is, of course, is that it's supposed to be evolving. It's supposed to be constantly shaping us and the environment to each other mm -hmm. in, in powerful ways. Um, I, see the thing I have, uh, you know, the thing I have about that is I tend to think of. Well, sorry, that's, I was about to say something that sounded ridiculously pretentious. <laughs> One idea I play with is about this, about an, a, something that's imaginal, uh, that is itself a, a distributed symbol. So maybe the symbols we should be considering now are distributed symbols, and so a symbol for, right you know, things that can activate the machinery of the unconscious in sort of a Jungian fashion, things that allow us to track and pick up on 
you know, the movements and the machinery of our culture. But then I also, and, but notice how you're moving also beyond that. You're also moving into, you know, our, our fittedness to, well, the actual natural world, the, if, the if, it, it, ecological, and I think ultimately even the ontological. And I think God, right, is a, is a distributed symbol for how all of those things can sometimes constellate together in a way that starts to become mutually affording. So the collective unconscious, right? Uh, the machinery of uh, uh, culture, uh, the ecological machinery, and even the way sort of the ontological principles of how intelligent, uh, about how, you know, reality unfolds for us. Uh, because, you know, the, the lines between all of these things blur. The ecology is dependent on the weather, which is ultimately explained, right? In very ontological terms and causal terms. You see what I'm trying to do? And that when we when people get away of sort of constellating that together uh, to get those things all in mutual resonance. So I'm playing with the idea of distributed symbols as the best thing for capturing these recursively distributed systems. Uh, and, and I think that you come out that in mythology, you yeah. get the Trinity, uh, you get trinities in Christianity, you get trinities obviously in Vedanta, you know, in aspects of Hinduism. And so you get this idea, uh, right, uh, uh, and even in, uh, uh, you know, uh, ancient Hebrew culture, you have the Elohim. God is somehow plural in some weird way, right? Um, um, and so um, that's what I'm, I'm sort of playing with right now. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. But I, so that's what, what, when you ask people what they mean, right, uh, by God, I, I, I think you're not pointing in one direction. On, you know, metaphysically, I think you're pointing here, yeah. pointing to culture, you're pointing to the ecology, and you're ultimately pointing to the ontology of the world. Mm -hmm. did, did that make any sense? I think so. just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll watch you back and I'll understand it better. Do you mind tilting your camera just a little bit so that um, oh. when you lean forward, uh, your, your head doesn't get cut off? Yeah, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, no, 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 it's fine. It's just, it's good. So, um, when we're pointing to God, so distributed symbol, right? So what would be the difference between a distributed symbol and a, and a, and a non-distributed symbol? I, mean, I think I'm hung up on that terminology a little bit. Well, because uh, what I'm trying to get by, uh, well, think about what's going with the distributed cognition. You have, with the birds, right, you have low, low side where there's sort of hubs of cognitive processing, and then you have communication channels between them. And let's say, like, let, let's say you have something like the self, in union terms, we've got this right, this agency that's doing kind of intra-psychic cognitive processing, and then you have a different agency. You have society, Durkheim, and the machinery there, and the in and the collective, you know, problem solving that it's doing. And then you have what you've been doing. You have the ecology and all the distributed cognition in there. And then, of course, right, you like I said, you ultimately have the ontological structure of the world. So that's what I mean. It, 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 you're not. That's what I mean. It's not a single symbol. You have, I have a symbol that allows me to activate this, access and activate this, activate and access that, and your shamanic symbols, your animistic symbols that allow me to activate and access the ecology of the forest. But ultimately, and this is, you know, this is in Marlo Ponti, right? I ultimately have sort of enacted symbols that put me in sync with, you know, basic ontological principles. You see them in the core of Neoplatonism or think of um, Taoism. Right, the, the, the Tao, the way everything is ultimately self-organizing and dynamic, that's ultimately an ontological move. That, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's interesting because one thing that strikes me is that um, when you can, can, if you conceive of the, of the birds as having a spirit that you can attune to, yeah. that you could then see that that spirit is in some sense, um, it has an independence, but it is also a subset of the broader spirit of the forest, right? Like, as you mentioned, the yep. trees have have also their language that you can attune to. Yep. And, Very much. Uh, and, you know, there's information coming in from like how fast the leaves are changing that may make you realize something that you wouldn't realize otherwise. Or if there's leaves that are, um, are changing color out of season, that tells you something. And there's all this yep. information that's happening in that environment. Um, even then, what the types of trees are growing in various areas. Yeah. I'll tell you a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so there's so much, there's so, there's so much there. And then of course that, you know, you can think of that forest as part of the broader spirit of the land, let's say. Yeah. 
And then that's, you know, that's, that's, as you said, that bases out into like the universe, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and then in some sense that creates a, uh, like a, a sense of the spiritual, which has a, a oneness and a multiplicity at the same time. Exactly. So how all things participate in the one is a classic Neoplatonic theme. Yeah. Right. And I've, I've been reading, uh, the, the Aeneid that Plotinus writes about soul, which is basically what you're talking about with spirit, right? And how, how there's a sense there's a soul for the world, but there's also a soul for individual things. Like, and it's it's exactly that kind of gradation. People were trying to work this out, and and like, and they, they devoted a lot of time, and then it's not wasted time and effort trying to get like really clear about a way of thinking about all of these relations that you're putting your finger on right now. So there's a couple a couple things there that, that came up in this chain of thought that I wanted to share with you as well. One, so there was uh, like I, I brought up Peterson and his description of God, but there's also there, you know like Peterson's been immensely influential for me as we mentioned. But I, I I feel like sometimes there's like he articulates two halves of something, but then articulates one side much more strongly, and you can see him lean into it. And oh yeah, very much right. Um, I feel like. In, in his description of the archetypal, he talks about the feminine and its ambivalence and the masculine and its ambivalence and how we need to have an understanding of both, right? Father culture, mother nature. Um, but he also, it feels like to me, like when he talks about the masculine heroic, that is really well articulated and, and the feminine heroic doesn't feel nearly as well articulated. I agree, we've talked about this before. Yeah. I agree. I and this agree. feels like another place where we're run, where I feel like I'm running into that because I feel like when I was talking about Jordan Peterson with my students and, and, and this, this reclamation of the West, they're not hearing the, the understanding of the spirit of the forest, which is what's driving and really interesting to them, right? It's like that aspect of it. And that's also been like, I don't know if I've told you this, but I have had this question in my mind, uh, like if I, if I had the chance to speak with Jordan, like w the first question I would wanna ask him is, Okay, so there's this archetypal world where you have the masculine, the feminine, and the divine individual, right? The father yeah. culture, mother nature, divine individual. And we have to, if, if we are not, if we are not, if we don't have archetypes that, that allow us to look at all of this, then, then we're incomplete, right? So if you only see nature as positive, a la like an environmentalist, extreme environmentalist type, you're missing a lot. And if you yeah. only see culture as positive and not destructive, you're missing a lot. Um, right. And you're, you're going to end up in a place that's very ideologically dangerous. So, okay, that's great. And there's feminine, there's masculine, there's the individual. But you also make the claim, Peterson does, that, that Christianity is the most archetypally complete religion. Yeah. And well, yet. I'm and very yet. critical of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, and yet there's no feminine spirit that is held at the same rank, right? There's the, the father, the son, and the Holy ghost, right? Yeah. One of my good friends is a Christian and I, I joke with him that that's the ghost of the divine feminine. That's not being addressed here. Right. Yeah. And, and, and we know that, you know, historically Yahweh had a female consort, right? Yes. At one point, but, um, but it strikes me because it's like, you have to be able to talk about the spirit of culture as he's describing in that discussion with Sam Harris, but also the spirit within nature. Yeah. And if you don't, then there's something unbalanced and this, so, okay, let me, let me just finish this thought for a second. Keep going, keep going, next, please. Next to something. So then I was thinking about, I, I just happened while I'm reading Abrams and while I'm reading young, I'm reading the Chronicles of Narnia to my children. Wow. Right. And Chronicles of Narnia is about these traumatized kids in London from around the period of World War II who go out into the country and they escape into this magical world where Jesus is right there, yeah. right? This is the world where Jesus is present for you and is gonna save your butt, right? Right, right, right. But that world is filled with satyrs and fawns and talking animals and naiads and dryads. The spirit of the forest, the spirit of the animals, the spirit of the trees, is all present and not only that but um but the capacity of mankind to become blind to those spirits is a central point in the story and the magician's yeah. nephew right 
uh, the uncle of, uh, I can't remember, the Uncle Andrew, right, cannot hear Aslan speak because he treats him as a dumb beast. Yes. And in, and in Prince Caspian, as we're going into Prince Caspian, the, the Telmarines have taken over the land and they've turned most of the animals into dumb beasts because they no longer listen to them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I was thinking about how in this, this, oh, okay. This is gonna take me a little while to unpack. So <laughs> uh, please be patient. Um, so there's, so, so there's this, there's something in Lewis where he's saying he's this great apologist for Christianity, right? And he wants to bring us back to Christianity. But in this children's story that he tells, he unites his Christianity with a return to animism. Yes, very much. And very that's much. very outside of the main line of Christianity. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, as I understand it, like there's theological debates about, you know, most, most theology didn't believe that animals had souls. Yes, they kind of clearly thought that. Um, right, and then you, you know, and tell me if I'm wrong, but my reading of this from you, because I'm, you know, I haven't gone and read these, you know, a lot of this information is coming from you or Jordan. Um, but like a lot of that kind of starts with Thomas Aquinas, right? That the world is split and we're yeah. no longer homed in a world of animate spirits that we're in participation with. Yeah. After yeah. the, his yeah. confrontation with Aristotelian science. Is that? I, I, I think that, yeah, I think this, uh, the splitting of the supernatural and the natural um, is one of, I mean, I, I think like Aquinas is ultimately very Neoplatonic, but he splits the two and he, he does it for, like, a, like you said, for uh, reasons of confronting with Aristotelian science. But I think it does do what you said. It tends to move, it, it tends to, it tends to empty the world. I mean, this was part of the Nietzschean critique. When you split things like that, right, and then you say, and then what happens is this world is now the natural world becomes completely equated with the fallen world and it, it, it has no value in and of itself. It only has a value as a way of getting you to this world. And then what the problem that you then face is if you start to really realize that this world is inaccessible to you and maybe it doesn't even exist, then you're left with this, but this is the world that you've thrown, that has been, this is the, the world that you've thrown away, right? Um, and, uh, and so that's, I mean, I think there's deep connection uh, as Nietzsche articulates between that separation and the rise of nihilism, yeah, um, I, I think that, that that's exactly the case. Yeah, um, I, think it's, uh, I mean, it's something you've articulated before, but to me, that's such a profound idea, the idea that we, we extracted meaning out of the world that we exist in and placed it in a supernatural world, and then science killed the supernatural world, so we're left yeah, with yeah. a dead world that, we're, that is meaningless that we inhabit, because, yeah, we, because yeah, we took all of the meaning out of this world invested it somewhere else and then lost that too i think that's right well there's a lot going on in lewis right so remember what uh i think it's in the magician's nephew or maybe it's in the lion the witch in the wardrobe uh you know um i you know i i, I don't know what they teach children these days it's all in plato right uh, and so yes. there's a neo yeah there's a neoplatonic vision running through there um, it's in the and, line, the witch in the wardrobe at the very end, uh, yeah. Cedric or not Cedric, sorry. His name is Diggory. Diggory, yeah. who's the magician's nephew, yeah. grows up to become the professor That's Cedric, right. at the end yeah. of, uh, Lion, the yeah. witch in the wardrobe. Right. Which is a really interesting, uh, take on this, uh, because he's trying to get, you know, he's, he's basically invoking, um, uh, the pre-Aristotelian Neoplatonic, you know, pre-Aristotelian Plato and then the later Neoplatonic vision. Uh, and that's clearly what's going on. And you see that, and this comes out in practical consequences. And th give me a sec, because this aligns with what you're talking about. And I asked Paul about this when I talked to him recently, the most recent conversation. I, and you know, I, I wanted to make sure that this is a true story. And he said it is true. And I, Paul's an expert on um, on uh, Lewis. That a, a, a young girl once came to Lewis. Yeah, and said, yeah, you're me yeah, about I love. You know, I have a confession. You know. I love Aslan more than Jesus. And he basically said, that's okay. That's okay because it wasn't the particular historical form that he thought was relevant. She was entering into uh, a correct relationship with, you know, the, uh, he would. Divine. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, you, you, you know, the, it, Lewis is a, is a tough nut to crack, that's for sure. But there's so much going on there, and I, I think you're right. Um, 
Lewis is pointing, he's trying to do a couple things. He's trying to revivify the Neoplatonism within Christianity uh, to give us a, um, um, something that, um, well, is basically a scaffolding for the cultivation of wisdom because the scientific worldview isn't doing that for you. So you need, he wants to revive, because what the professor's talking about at the end there, now that I remember, he's not talking about knowledge, he's talking about a lack of wisdom. He's talking about foolishness, right? Yeah. So he's trying to revivify the Neoplatonism to say, no, no, we need to get, we need a, we need, we need a scaffolding for wisdom. And then like you said, I, I think he is trying uh, in connection with that to you know, bring back the, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, the spirit of nature, the way you're talking about it here. Mm -hmm. um, Jung wrestled with this too, right? He thought the elevation of Mary to almost godhood was a really important event. And I guess I take it there's something similar that Mary has a similar high status within Eastern Orthodoxy. But I, I also agree with you that it, it's not clear to me uh, that uh, Christianity, I mean, Christianity is, there are theologians who are working very hard on this, who are trying to come back around to um, the capacity to see nature as sacred. See, there's deep reasons against this. Because um, it goes back to the way how Yahweh is a different God. Mm -hmm. Yahweh is a God who moves through time and space. He's a God of history. And yeah. as you're rightly pointing, he's therefore much more of a cultural God. He's a God of history, and he's not bound to a particular location or function. And what that means, right, is that he's very different from the pagan gods who are bound to the natural world in, in a very tight manner. Mm -hmm. And so anything that sort of seems to be tying the divine or the sacred to the natural smacks of paganism and pantheism for people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, 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 and so Christianity has had a very sort of uh, attitude uh, towards that. But on the other hand, it's tried to resist the Gnosticism that says that the material world is evil and imprisoned. And so Christianity has got this really ambiguous state relationship to the natural world. It's somehow good, but it's not sacred. It's, so I think there's actually, uh, to put it in a bit of a, a bit of maybe a bit harshly, I think there's a lot of confusion in Christianity about nature. Mm -hmm. This is why, right, the, the, the rejection of naturalism is also, I think, often very confused. Naturalism as opposed to supernaturalism. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So. Naturalism as the worldview that sustains the natural sciences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can, can you know, can spirituality be embedded within naturalism? That's a... a yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So to go back to my, my, my question for Jordan, right? I, I, where is where is the fully articulated divine, right? Even Mary, as Mary is elevated, she doesn't become ambi ambivalent. She only represents the positive element, right? Yeah, exactly. You agree that there is a negative element. It's it's in Lilith who isn't even in the story, right? Yeah, yeah, is excluded. Yes, and she's not. She's not. She doesn't. She's not a fully represented individual, right? Where you because we are all ambivalent creatures, right? You know, Scholzenitsyn. The line down every human line between good and evil runs down every human heart, right? Yeah, yeah, so if yeah. you divide the feminine between Lilith and Mary, you're you're denying that that ambivalence in some sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and that, that I mean, Jung Jung made a, a very similar argument, um, but you know, I have a much larger argument against Jordan, and that I think his representation of Jung as some sort of a Christian apologist is is deeply mistaken about Jung. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Young well enough. So I, uh, I'll let you guys uh, deal with that one. But, but what I wanted to bring up was this idea that okay, um, it seems to me that if you want to revive Christianity in some sense, you have to deal with this. But you especially have to deal with this because two things are true right now, which are were not historically true. Right. One is. Um, in, in some sense, in all the traditional mythology, mother, mother nature is in, precedes and is in many ways more powerful than father culture, right? Like right. Tiamat comes first. Uh -uh. Blood is there, right? And then, you know, then you have, you have 
Yahweh who says, you know, I have defeated Le uh, Leviathan, I have defeated Behemoth, right? Like those are representations of the, of the terrifying power of nature. And he's claiming that culture now is, is superseding that. Yes. And never before. Culture and history. Yeah. Culture and history. Yep. But never before have we existed at a time in which father culture is a danger to mother nature like now. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. So if you have an archetypal religious structure that has no articulation of this aspect of the sacred at a time when like small actions over here can have massive consequences over here. That seems like it, it, it it's really missing something that it needs to act effectively as a guide. I, I agree. I agree. And then the, the other aspect of that is, you know, for most of the history of Christianity and, and, and Judaism before that uh, women for you, you can call them oppressive regions or you can, you could stipulate that it's just biology that was holding them down. But women didn't have the opportunity to wield power the way that they have it now. Yes. Yeah. And it seems to me that, that you can't respect the agency of something that you don't see as an ambivalent creature. Mm. Yeah. This is a, I, I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from you, but um, yeah, I, I've heard that, that this critique made before, um, yeah. that um, uh, the, the, the separation, uh, you know, to the shape, the, the separation, the, the, it's, it's like the separation of the supernatural from the natural, right? It's not, it's not the opponent processing of yeah. the symbol, it's the separation, right? You have the, the separation of the whore from the mother, the chaste mother and, and the always, always uh, decadent whore. Right, and and that that um, that is a, a a a model that will not in any way in either way help women within um, what you're talking about a culture in which um, real power uh, real power is possible for them now. Yes, I agree. Like how how do how do we? It, it feels like like you know, women are a mystery, right? That's the classic thing. But it's in some sense, like we have archetypally, religiously cut them into pieces that we can't yep. integrate. Yep. Right? I agree. Like, like I grew up in the counterculture and I think that's a, a big part of the way that I look at things. But I still feel like, like as a young man, the idea of the, the, the woman as the object of love and the woman as the object of lust were very hard to integrate, right? Yes. Yep. And the idea that women were not just objects of lust, but, but agents of lust. Yeah, 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 yeah. It took me, I mean, I think it literally took me into my thirties to be able to like, to fully sort of have a representation of the feminine in my mind that was equipped with her own lust. Yeah. 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 And that's it. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's something, you know, that's inherent in, in growing up as a boy or my own temperament, but it feels like it could be part of this cultural history for sure. I think it is. I mean, uh, I mean, we have to be careful not to overgeneralize, uh, but I do think there is um, a lot of ways in which the Christian heritage has really, really misframed the reality uh, of what women are. Now, I mean, again, there are Christians out there working hard on this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I've talked to Mary, you might have seen, I've had some conversations with Mary Cohen, and she is really trying to, you know, rearticulate uh, from, you know, she's deeply influenced by Ratzinger, who in some ways is conservative, I get that. But Ratzinger is also deeply informed by phenomenology, right? And so Mary's sort of doing this phenomenological research reinterpretation um, of what uh, you know masculinity and femininity mean and she's trying to resituate that within a Christian context so that there is a sense in which and it's of course I think completely appropriate that it's a woman Mary uh, who's doing this um, uh, um, and you know and, she, and she, Nom <laughs> what is that nominological determinism <laughs> yeah yeah um, so yeah so she uh, she represents, I think, a, 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 a growing way in which I think women are going to play a significant role. How do I want to say this? I don't want to sound too illogical. If Christianity, if Jonathan Pajot is right, if Christianity man manages once again to somehow restructure itself like it has done in the past, 
And I, I, I don't, I'm not confident that that's going to happen. But what I say is if it's going to happen, I think women are going to play a very substantial role in that restructuring. Mm -hmm. And I think people like Mary are, are the vanguard of that kind of thing. And, and you have to understand, Mary is like she's in many ways an orthodox Catholic. She's not some sort of, you know, extreme left, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ultra feminist or something like that. That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not trying to diss feminism or anything like that. That's why I use the adjective ultra, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so she, she is, right? So she's, what I'm saying is she's working within what she considers her home of Catholic Christianity. She's not an outsider critiquing it. She's working within. But I think uh, she is doing, uh, you know, she represents what a lot of people are trying to do. Uh, I'm not saying I think I agree with her or her answers, or I, I think they should be taken seriously. Um, but uh, I do think that the presence of people like Mary actually strengthens your argument because the fact that Christianity is sort of organically bubbling up uh, a way of trying to fix this problem, I think actually is good evidence that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, at the way that Mary has risen as a figure of devotion in different Christian contexts over and over again, and not just Mary, but female saints like St. Saint Bridget in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, you know, I was thinking about this idea that, you know, um, you're talking about, we have language, we have an inherent drive for language, but the language has, it has to be provided by the environment, right? But obviously, if you, you're not a full human being if you don't have language. Exactly. Yep. And I was thinking about this idea that in, sense, in a sense, like our psychology has a God-shaped hole in it. Augustine said that. Right. Augustine said that. Okay. Yeah. So God, there's a God-shaped hole in the psychology. But what, what came out of that for me was like, how, how predetermined is that God-shaped hole? Right? Like how, yeah. like, you know, like Peterson's argument is that, you know, men selected men over time for these characteristics of heroicness that then they were taken off the top by women and that's the spirit of culture and then over time that's internalized the better sort of internal representation you have of that the easier it is for you to match with that and that's what an archetype is that's what what what, what, it, what he's talking about and so there's this interesting qu question i think it's a very open question of like okay let's let's assume that there is a religion or spiritual whole in our psychology um you know i think like if you look at scott scott atran and pascal boyer i haven't read them i've, I've only seen them through other people but I have. you know there's we know to some degree that when you take away religion you don't get atheism yeah, right you kind of get animism is what it looks like you, you, you get well you well you can you sometimes get gnosticism that's what young found right you get animism you can get gnosticism I, I, I think there's a plurality of default settings mm -hmm. uh, for that, that uh, God-shaped hole you're talking about. I think it's, I mean, I think it's very much like Chomsky, if you'll allow me to extend the analogy, like Chomsky's notion of universal grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, what you come with is, uh, and uh, somebody wrote a book about this, arguing that he thinks, I, can't, I read this book, I can't remember the title of the author, I apologize to the author, I can't remember your name. Uh, the idea that we have something like universal grammar, uh, but not for language, but a universal grammar uh, for sort of mythopoetic enacted symbolism and, and, and imaginal work. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and that sort of strikes me as right. But if that's the case, that's an argument neither for perennialism nor for relativism. It's an argument for pluralism, that there's a universality of process, but the products that can be like, there's a universal grammar, but the number of languages we can have from that is indefinitely large. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting in this case is if we, if we, we go back to that question of like how, how predetermined are the archetypes in your head? What this argument about what we're, we've seen repeatedly within Christianity might indicate is that there, you know, this is basically what I think Peterson argues in Maps of Meaning is that there is a feminine divine represented in your mind. Mm -hmm. What's striking to me is that he argues that and then it goes and argues that the best reputation of the archetypal overall is a religion that, from my perspective, has a very weak representation of that. I agree. I agree. 
Um, and, you know, you know, and Jordan talks and he, he'll invoke the yin and yang symbol, mm -hmm. uh, and the, but he won't pick up on, you know, the, the profound role that nature plays within Taoism in a way it doesn't play um, in Christianity. Yeah. Like, and, you know, and, 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 and yeah, I, I know, <laughs> I'm trying not to, I, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, for a lot of Jordan's work and, um, and I'm very grateful for a lot of the work he's done and the way he's supported my work. Yeah, um, I was recently sharing your talks, which was great. Yep, yeah, he, he, he's a good colleague. Um, and we were, we were on the edge of becoming friends before he rocketed yeah, into yeah. superstardom. And so that's all the case. Um, and I'm not, I know I'm not trying to, uh, dismiss that in any way. Um, uh, I, I significantly disagree with him on his political vision and I'm allowed to do that because I'm a Canadian and I'm at the same university that he is. And I see a lot of the situation very differently. I don't think he was properly treated, etc. So. Bang. Let's put that aside. And what I want to say is, all that being the case, I still have deep criticisms, and and I think you're, I know you're very respectful. He's a very important figure for you, and he, and I'm not trying to challenge that. But I think you're feeling you're, you're there's a critique you're forming, which is like there's a contradiction here, um, and I think that contradiction is what I've been trying to point out. With I think it is a contradiction to try and derive a Christian apologetics out of a Jungian framework. I think that is a contradiction. I do not think. That works. I think that is an argument that is deeply, deeply flawed. And I'm allowed, I mean, I'm gonna get into trouble with this no matter what I do, right? I'm allowed to criticize his arguments. I'm not saying he's a bad person. I'm not saying he's not heroic. I'm not saying blah. I'm not saying anything about his character. I don't resent him. I don't resent him. I've defended Jordan at times, but I think it's a bad argument. And it's a bad argument, and it's a bad argument. Yeah, and, and it doesn't also mean that there isn't lots of insight and wisdom in contained in the argument, right? Just of course not. Bad arguments have great insights in them, right. very often. Uh, yeah. that's, why, that's why they survive. If they were just bad arguments, they would disappear. You know, Peterson himself says that like the, the, uh, the death anxiety theorists, you know, he feels like they're wrong, but he also feels like they're wrong in an incredibly important way. Oh, totally, totally. And, so and I think that, that you can argue the same thing that you think that this, this, this marriage of Jungianism with an apologetics of Christianity has a, a linchpin that's that's simply unstable. Well, I and think there's many a lot of wisdom in the rest of it, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I've articulated other linchpins. I don't think there's just one. Yeah. I think there's other moves in the argument that are similarly flawed. But I want to reinforce what you're saying. There are lots of insight. In I have the same attitude like towards that kind of argument that I have for Descartes' arguments. Mm -hmm. I think Descartes' arguments are, are, are ultimately wrong. I sometimes say this to my class, I wish I could be wrong like Descartes' wrong. Yeah. I just, when I'm wrong, I'm just John and I'm wrong and nobody cares, right? But when Descartes' wrong, the whole culture shifts in like a powerful way because there's tremendous insight. There's tremendous conceptualization. There's tremendous theorizing in Descartes. Right, and so that's why I treat Descartes very respectfully, even though I ultimately reject his arguments. There's no, and there's no inconsistency there. I can, re I can respect somebody's argument and respect what they're doing, and still ultimately think it's a bad argument. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the way to take it. Yeah, I think, you know, like when you when you had your conversation with Anderson Todd, I also had that that sense of wanting to defend Peterson, because I think yeah. in some sense he's. I've been thinking about this myself in my my role as a teacher of movement that that I have uh, I, I have in some sense entered an archetypal role for people. Yes, uh, and that 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 Peterson's ideas are are no longer in some sense there there's an academic layer to Peterson's ideas and not, and that's very very important, but there but he's also a an archetype within the culture. Yes, and that critical. Yeah, that critiquing him in the way that an academic critiques for people who are not academics who are following him for those other aspects, yeah, yeah. Is, it's hard to see it, you know. Very, it's, very, it, very, very. very. I th but I think what happened around that was actually what should have happened. In fact, I'm very pleased. You came to me mm -hmm. and you, you, you made the defense 
and then and we, we recorded this and we had what I consider a genuine via logos, yeah. right? In which we both got to a place out of that where I couldn't have got to on my own about, you know, the, the, the heroic stage of perhaps a better understanding of the archetype that is needed right now. Mm-hmm. I thought that was an exact, that's the kind of thing that should be happening. I'm not trying to foreclose on Jordan, yeah. or not at all. I want to provoke exactly what happened between you and I, and I thought the place where it went was beautiful, was yeah. great. And I feel like this is a continuation of that, right? Yes, I do. You know, you're, um, you're obviously concerned that people are going to be it as a criticism, and maybe, maybe we're talking a lot about the places where we have critiques of him. But for me, that's, that's coming from a place where like my worldview has, has been colonized by the guy in so many ways that like, you know, it, it has to be, you know, the critique is of course nested within extraordinary respect. That, I, I, don't, I don't critique things that I don't consider important. I, I, my life is too finite for doing that. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I, can't, I can't do that. I, I, I wrote Jordan that specifically, explicitly, mm-hmm. when he, because before he, uh, sort of uh, tweeted about my work. He, he, he sent me a quick email and said, how are you doing? Like, how's your series going? And like, mm-hmm. pretty good. Or, are you happy with it? And I said, yeah. Um, and <laughs> then he said, well, okay, well, I, I, you know, I hope you can, I want to help you. I want you to get up to a million subscribers. And I thought, well, that's nice. awesome. But thank you. But then I said, no, Jordan, I missed you because, because we, used to, we used to meet and talk in the halls yeah. for Pete's sake, right? And, and I said, you know, your work is so close to mine and so important that I have to criticize it, right, yeah. right, right, uh, right. And, 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 but it would be better if I could do that in actual dialogue with you, like when we've had public debates and discussions. That's what I would prefer. I don't like doing this one-sidedly. I don't want to, right? But be, precisely because his work is important and I respect him, that's why I have to criticize it. I have to critique it, right? But or, I, I don't want him to be deified. That, that ultimately makes him irrelevant in a very important way that I think is the wrong way to, I think both demonizing him and deifying him make him, uh, treat him unfairly and make, and make his work deeply irrelevant. Yeah. Um, so that, that, and if it, so that's what. To, if it can't, if it can't be grown off of, and, and it cannot, you can't, you can't grow from it if you can't critique it. Exactly. And he, that's so ultimately not. an archetypal thing, right? You know, the son and the father, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that to, to, to deviate from that for a second, I, as I was going through all this stuff sitting there, um, you know, after reading that passage from David Abrams, I had this, this sense. So when I encountered Peterson's work, one of those ideas that was so powerful for me was the idea of, of rescuing the bones of your father from the underworld, right? Yeah. Yeah, very powerful. And, and and this is one of the things that I think has has been very different for me from many of the other people kind of in my sphere, because I view the West as something that has an immense amount of profound wisdom to be extracted. Yeah, you know, I agree with you on this. Yeah, yeah. But I think that a lot of people are, um, they're stuck in the interaction. And so I, I came up with this parable in my head and I, I need to work on it. But it basically was like, Imagine a boy who has, um, who has a father who, who has one father who's not present and he's told how terrible he is all the time, right? But he sees his work in the world and it's not all terrible. And he constantly interacts with other people who have respect for him. And then there's another father who he's being told all the time is, 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 is this leader who's amazing, who's, you know, the vision of the future, who, who, you know, but what he's experiencing is that he's narcissistic and that he is inconsistent and hypocritical, yeah. right? And self-righteous. And self-righteous. And for me, that's the story of my relationship with the culture and the counterculture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So then, then, like, as I'm going to, to pull the bones of the father from the underworld, which is, like, I think one of the reasons that, that Peterson has had so much profundity is because... Um, or he's had such a profound impact on people is because we like as an academic culture, as like an elite culture, we have decided that our own heritage is evil. Well, well that's something where Jordan and I are in deep, uh, deep agreement. Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, well, you know, I've done it repeatedly. <laughs> You're I, 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 I'm deeply critical of that hypothesis. Yes. Deeply yeah. critical of that hypothesis. You made a very big point in the first time that we talked that, yeah. that, 
that we don't have to only look to Taoism and, yeah. and Zen yeah, and totally. Buddhism, yeah. to find spiritualities and mysticisms that that can that can inform how you respond. Totally, totally. So, that's that's something where Jordan and I are very consonant. That yeah. yes. Now I think he happens to misrepresent it. I think he he over homogenizes and over vilifies the postmoderns as the you know what's happening. I, I don't think that's fair. I, I mean, especially with you know aspects of Derrida and how Derrida has influenced the rise of negative theology and a rebirth of Neoplatonic uh, thinking, or Foucault and the later Foucault, you know, doing work on the care of the self and how that how he gets involved with Pierre Hadot and ancient philosophy and Stoicism. Like that is also uh, what you find in Foucault and Derrida. You have to. It, 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 so I think I agree with uh, like. So you said that the, Jordan and I agree with trying to say that the West is, you know, a broken, horrible thing. <clears throat> I think that's a mistake. Uh, but I, I am, uh, I don't tend to agree with him um, in his portrayal as of the, the postmodernist as sort of the cadre, the cabal that is out there sort of, you know, uh, uh, promulgating this. Uh, I, I don't think that, I mean, Absolutely. there are aspects of postmodernism to do this, but that's not, that's not genuinely. I think a sufficient account. I think uh, I think the modernism of the Enlightenment should be deeply criticized. I do it too. Yeah, I think I think I think that's right. You know, I think. Um, are you familiar with Ken Wilber? Yes, yes. I'm just beginning to. I, I've ha I've had a couple of talks with uh, 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 Doshin, uh, who's a uh, who's a uh, uh, Roshi, um, and he's recommended. I, I bought Wilber's book, The Religion of Tomorrow, because that was recommended as the book that I would find most relevant. Um, and I'm going to start reading Wilbur's work when I get a chance. So I, I think that I lean, or I, let's say I feel more like Peterson feels about postmodernism versus how you feel. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm right. not as familiar with, with, with Foucault and Derrida. What I'm, what I've experienced is having gone through university as an anthropology student. Yes, I, I get that. Postmodernism ha was, was, uh, was, you know, tr transcendent and having felt like essentially that they had destroyed the discipline of everything that was valuable. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that I've seen that happen over and over again in the rise of the woke generation. So like whatever F Foucault and Dorita said directly, like I'm looking at the, the, the second and third order effects of it and saying, this is a deeply poisoned tree. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's how it feels to me. And I, I'm, I'm not going to make a, I, I don't have the, the chops to make a technical argument. To, to back. Uh, what I'm asking you to do is look at uh, there's other branches of the tree. Yeah, that yeah. You can find much more relevant and consonant, with, in fact, with what we're talking about right now. Read John Caputo. Uh, like, you know, his book on Heidegger, The Mystical Element in Heidegger, had a profound, profound, deeply positive in, impact on it. Yeah. Things like that. So I bring up Wilbur, though, because Wilbur, um, Wilbur's critique of postmodernism, he, you know, he calls it the, the mean green meme, right? And he says, <laughs> fundamentally, it's unstable, and it collapses back to, to a extremely uh, negative tribalism. Uh, yeah. So, you know, but he also sees it as a tier that precedes what he calls the integral stage, right? It's like, you have to go through, you have to understand postmodernism, you have to, because, um, like, I think sometimes the modernist period is like naively empirical, right? It's uh -huh. Um, if you can measure it and, 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 and quantify it, then you can say that it's real in some sense. And it, yeah. it, it's like, there's a lot that gets missed. And postmodernism, I think, has real critiques, but it has no, it doesn't create a new stable foundation. Well, that's the thing. I mean, so what I would say is that postmodernism, again, I'm hesitant to use it as a category. I think you should you should we talk about specific arguments made by specific theorists would be sure. more accurate. But let's let's play, play this way right now because I, I I mean I have good faith in you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, um. So, um, I th I think and I think what you see especially in Foucault is a realization that postmodernism, um, while critiquing the epistemology of the Enlightenment, it was not affording what was one of the things that was actually lost in the Enlightenment, which is the wisdom tradition, mm -hmm. and that. What need what was needed is a positive project, uh, bringing back um, the cultivation of wisdom, and you know, and that's part of you know 
part of the Heideggerian tradition that comes from Marlo Ponti and other things like that. Um, and like I said, you can see that coming out very carefully, I think, um, toward the end of Foucault's career. Um, there are uh, not so much him, but what a lot of the people who have been influenced by him ha have taken up. Um, that, so, so one of the, and this is something I'm recently working on, the, you know, that modernity is around these, what I call the three monos, and I'm sort of also playing with like, you know, having mono as an illness. <laughs> um, so there's the part you already know, the monolithic mind, that all of thinking is reduced to propositional knowing. Yeah. And then there's the monologic mind that, right, the cognition is ultimately uh, done monologically in your head rather than dialogically in distributed cognition, even though the cognitive science and evidence is mounting against that dramatically. Yeah. Um, and then also monophasic, right, that uh, we, we, there's only one state of consciousness that gives us access to reality. And we shouldn't pursue altered states of consciousness or transcendence or transformation because that's just clouded bad thinking. And I think those three monos are something that postmodernism like effectively sort of challenged and shattered. Um, but I think the and I think what I see some of the meta modern people trying to do is to try and say, but the answer is not just to lay in the rubble of the discarded monos. The answer is, okay, but what does it mean to go with, live in a culture that recognizes the importance of a, of a polyphasic mind who recognizes multiple kinds of knowing and thinks that the mind is inherently dialogical in nature? What does that mean? And I think that I'm trying to understand metamodernism uh, as around that kind of idea. And that way it's reconceiving what rationality means, reconceiving. Meta rationality, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, like chat. You're starting to also have a conversation with David Chapman Ellis. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I I haven't studied Wilbur's work very deeply, but one of the interesting aspects of it is so. So he talks about I think it's turquoise, right? It's the or that's spiral dynamics. Then he borrows it, right? There's the there's a the lean the mean green meme or boomeritis, right? That's the the postmodern thing, and then then there's the integral layer, right? And what you're talking about is maps, right? I think to what he's calling the integral layer. Right. And, and I think of you and Peterson both as integral thinkers. I but know. I think that when you're, when you enter the integral, whenever you enter a level, right? The most obvious thing is that the level that you were, that what just was is, is really bad, right? <laughs> you can see all the flaws in it, right? Yeah. Now, the integral level is the level at which you're supposed to be able to start, you know, according to Wilbur, it's the level at which you, you begin to be able to integrate the wisdom of each level, right? So, right. so nationalism, right, goes past tribalism, right? And then, then, there's, then there's a, like a global sense of, of yeah. community, right? But then there's a level at which you, you can say, okay, there's actually important things that, that were only really seen by the people at the tribal level. Right. And they were forgotten at the national level and this level. And now let's let's remember all three, right? Let's remember let's 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 hold these insights, right? Magical thinking becomes uh, you know, religious thinking becomes modern thinking, but actually there's ways that we need to be able to access all of them. Yeah, what you and I are talking about in fact today. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then so like I I, don't, I, I bring this up, I guess, to defend uh, Jordan, but but I think that this, I don't know, maybe this will be an interesting thing for you to, but I think that Jordan, in part, he's, he's at that level of um, of reacting yeah. to, he's, he, you know, he's entering the integral and he can still really see all the stuff that's happening yeah. with, with this and he's surrounded by it. And so th there's a, there's a tendency to be very reactive. So I kind of like, for me, the way that I've in my head looked at you guys and, you know, uh, I say this with respect, but but it feels like to me you're more deeply into you're more deeply in the integral level, but the, so it's as if you're kind of balanced here where you're the postmodern is almost not relevant to you anymore. Yeah. 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 Whereas I see Peterson having a kind of he's kind of more linear through those layers, right? Yeah. He hasn't spread out at the integral layer. He has some insights that are very high, very deeply integral. And then he has places where he's really stuck on those insights that are at the point where you're breaking out of the postmodern. And yeah. so there's much more reactivity still to that. And I think that you- That's very good right? I mean, sorry, it sounds self-promotional on my part, but I mean, I, but I, I, was, I was actually really impressed by 
the the clarity of that. That was really good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so one thing that I think is when you when when you're when the the pathology or the way of thinking that that doesn't serve is sufficiently far away, it's easier to go back and pull out the the useful pieces right. and then disaggregate. You can say, okay, if you say postmodernism. What do you mean? I, here's a great insight from Foucault. Here's a great insight from Lacan. Here's a great insight from uh, from uh, you know uh, Bouillard or you know. Um, or 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 uh, uh, Derrida, right? And but when when you're when you're when you're seeing the when, or or you've just moved past it yourself, yeah, right. You look at it more as a system, right? So for me, postmodernism is is what I see as the aggregate behavior of people who are sure. at that mindset, and it looks really unsustainable. Does that make sense? I think it does, and I mean, I don't, I mean, how, how do I, I, I want to try to be fair to it. I think that's what, the points you made are excellent. Um, and I, I do agree that there is that aggregate behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it is as, as, as prominent um, um, as, you know, as Jordan made it out to be, uh, um, uh, especially in the psych department, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, that, that's kind of, you know, um, I'm sort of saying yes, but a little bit no. Um, yeah. well, right? I think so and I, and I wanted to say, you know, I, I, when I talked about the branches of the tree, like this all starts in Heidegger, right? It all, uh, you know, you know, Foucault and Derrida are deep and, and, and deconstruction is, you know, it's a child of Heidegger's notion of destruction, right? Uh, all that stuff, and, you know. Heidegger is like you know Marlo Ponti and all that whole. Heidegger is the godfather of four e cognitive science. So I see all this powerful benefit to breaking the Cartesian grip, death grip yeah, on yeah. understanding the mind and the world. And so I see this, you know, much more. I came up, you know, sure. that way. And so this, I, I have a much more. Po I see a, 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 a huge aggregate that has this huge positive value. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I've had this debate with a lot of my friends about postmodernism where, you know, like people will say Peterson himself is a postmodernist because he's, you know, he, he, he's not an analytical philosopher, like, you know, uh, he, he's post Heideggerian, right? Post right? He's, he's within that continental philosophy tradition. So a lot of people who, who, it, it, you know, I'm nowhere near as sophisticated in my reading of, of philosophy as you are, obviously. But what it looks like to me is that for a lot of people, it's hard to disaggregate like the critique of pure rationality yeah. into Heidegger and that whole continental tradition from the specific outlet of of uh, of of, of postmodernism, right? So you, it's like you have analytical philosophy and like you know, just pure scientific epistemology without dealing with the critique of rationalism on one side. And that's like Steven Pinker. Um, and then Peterson's obviously not there. No, right? exactly. Very much. He's on, he's on, he's a branch of the chain that comes from, from Heidegger and, and Hegel and, and Nietzsche. And, yeah. and then, and then that's closer to the postmodernists than it is to the Pinkers. Very much so. Or, and, you know, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, that's. I think what you're saying. I, I'm in complete agreement with what yeah. you're saying. And, and so I'm often, I often, I, I have a difficulty understanding Jordan's um, deep, almost reverence for Nietzsche, right? Uh, so, it, 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 so I, I, it, 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 that putting that all together, uh, it, it, uh, the way you've done though, is, is is helpful. It's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm 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 happy to I'm happy if it's helpful. It's kind of crazy for me because I'm you know I'm just I'm, I'm sampling these things through you through Jordan, right? Um, but 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 maybe that and not to dismiss any of your excellencies or cognitive abilities, but maybe also your position as being you know closely closely outside mm -hmm. gives you a kind of insight that I can't have. I yeah. mean that's 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 a very real possibility. Yeah. Well. If it's useful, that's wonderful. Um, so I, I wanted to, to just root back. I mean, I feel like we should uh, 
should kind of come to an end here. This has yeah. been a conversation, but I want to root back to this idea of the, of the two, of the two fathers and recovering the bones of the fathers, because right. in some sense, like, you know, the lean, the mean green meme of, of Ken Wilber, right? That's postmodernism. And it's also the counterculture. Right. Right. They're interrelated. Right, there's postmodernism as a philosophical movement, and then there's the, all the things that brought the counterculture out, and those are not just that. Yeah, yeah. Counterculture existed, and and I was the child of it. And the counterculture, you know, like um, one of the books that has an immense amount of impact on so many people who come towards my work is is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Right. Yeah. 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 You read that book? Yes, I have. Okay. So the West is the takers, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a book that's profoundly anti-Western. And yes, lot. very much so. And um, and that's that's kind of the attitude of the counterculture. But it's also a book that that calls to a renewal of the relationship with nature and an understanding of that that spirituality and recovering of the sacred that yeah. somehow got lost through a kindness and the supernatural. Well, that's why. Natural. That's why is it gorilla? I can't remember his name. Ishmael. Yes, Ishmael. Yeah. It's, Ishmael is the other, right? There's Israel, right? or, or yeah. was it Isaac, right? And there's Ishmael, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's also the main character. Well, you don't know if that's his name, he, but in Moby Dick, he has to be called Ishmael, right? And so, yeah, the meaning crisis is lumbering around that book, and resonating in, in, a, in a lot of powerful ways. And the fact that he's a talking gorilla is also like, your, goes towards your point. It's like, <laughs> Nar but it's Narnia again. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's it's the it's the animal it's the talking animal that actually carries the wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things is you know that that what I'm wrestling with, I guess, is this idea that Peterson is helping me recover the bones of of the culture, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But then also as a like I'm a child of the counterculture, and there's there's positive bones to be grabbed there. Yeah. Yeah, and in yeah. some sense, what you're saying is like, it's hard for you to to accept all of Peterson's perspective because you see the bones of postmodernism that we have to recover to build the next thing. I think so. Yes. So we need I, a critique, I, but we also need to move past that critique. Yes, I agree, totally. And and that critique of postmodernism has to be integrated and allied with. The recovery of the bones of our own tradition. Yes, very much. So we're so so to go back to it. It's like it, it's like the line, the witch in the wardrobe is the story, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we need Aslan and we need the talking trees and and the, and the badgers because we need <laughs> to hearing them, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and so we need this integration of 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 the wisdom of Christianity and and the Neoplatonism and the, the scientific empirical West with with the animistic, shamanistic, and you know, Eastern traditions, I think. I think so, yeah. And, and that's why I want to do, I mean, after I'm done after Socrates, uh, um, which is you know, trying to critique that whole, the three monos mm -hmm. and exemplify an alternative, that's why I want to do the God Beyond God, because I think the Kyoto School, um, we need to pay attention to Nishida and Nishitani and Maso Abe, because they're the people that are, are they, allow, they lay the foundation for the very project in all of the aspects we've talked about. That's why I keep recommending Religion and Nothingness is one of the great books that everybody has to read, okay. right? Um, um, and I had that excellent discussion with Jared Morningstar about Nishitani. Right? I think the Kyoto School is really, really um, important for this project that you have just articulated. Man, we gotta talk more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I, I've been working on this, this laying out the method that I showed you before on a deeper level about this idea that, that within body practices, mindfulness practices, nature and community, there is, there's necessary inter affordances of insight generation that, that are cut off when we don't treat these things in as part of it. Right. It's like for cognitive science, you're a body, that body is embedded in a universe, right? That body is, extended in a network of community right and it has to be acted out and practiced in order to grow and and so it you know what i, I was writing about this and i was like we can't do this practice of philosophia right i don't think we can have it if we don't have a body 
That's part oh, of what, of course. I mean, one of the things that's going to come out in after Socrates is we forget that, you know, there's the, there's the whole culture that's presupposed as, 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 as so apparent that it doesn't need to be discussed of the gymnasium, mm-hmm. right? The gymnastics is, is all, and it's all, and it's all through uh, the Socratic dialogues in really important and powerful ways. The, the body work is there. It's just that it was so obvious to everybody because it was so, like, and even, I think some of the dialogues even take place, right? It, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I think that's- The broad, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the wrestler. He, the wrestler. He's a wrestler, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I think there's that, but I wanted to point out just before, uh, because the first thing came up when you were you, 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 you laying down the four mm-hmm. of, of your method, I'm saying, I was thinking, there you go, right? There's a distributed symbol. Beautiful. There we go. There's a distributed symbol. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported, and we really appreciate your support. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.